It's my great honor to uh, introduce our first uh, guest, uh, Alex uh, Little from uh, NIST in uh, Maryland. Uh, I think uh, uh, the one thing that I know Alex is that he's the boss of uh, Rob Illich. And uh, <laughs> if you don't know Rob Illich, uh, the, the one thing I can tell you is that uh, if you want to find someone in the clean room at 2 a.m. in the morning, uh, that's Rob. Yeah. yeah. Um, he is now hired by Alex. That shows you how good of a boss uh, Alex is. Because he finds a real talent, actually, that knows how to run a team. Uh, the next thing that I want to share with you about Alex is that he actually wrote a paper about how to build a nanofab. I, <coughs> I, I read it many times already. Uh, but every time I read about it, uh, I still feel uh, there is so much thing that I haven't done in my team. Uh, so, uh, with uh, no further uh, introduction, I, I just want to hand it over to uh, Alex, and uh, he will share his story with us today, and uh, I'm pretty sure you're going to get impressed. Thank you. Great. Th thank you very much. Well. All right. So, so that's a, a little, what, does it sound okay? Yeah. Great. So thanks very much for the invitation to come and speak. As, uh, as Johnson said, I, I wrote a paper on uh, owning a nanofab. Um, and I will say, uh, you know, as a, as a research scientist, often downloaded, rarely cited. So you know, please read it and cite it. That would be great. Um, so I wanted to talk about the experience that I, I've gathered over the years in terms of user facility uh, operation and construction and so on. Um, I see my colleague John Nyberger in the audience, uh, who will be talking later. Um, for those of you who know Rob Illich, I don't think anybody's Rob's boss, actually. Um, <laughs> more, more a facilitator is, uh, is the sort of role I try and play in his case. So uh, let me get going here. Um, this is intended to be an interactive presentation, so please don't be shy. Do ask questions. Um, there's a lot of uh, sort of experience and knowledge that I wasn't able to capture in the slides um, or, or the paper for that matter. So, uh, so please do interrupt. So let's see. All right, that was not good. There we go. Um, so I want to acknowledge uh, the contributions of friends and coworkers here. Um, it was actually a multi-year effort to put the uh, put the paper together. Um, so Dave Sapluski, who is at Argonne, who uh, is closely connected with the nanofab there, Rob Illich, you've already heard about. My colleague June Lau, who is actually an electron microscopist and has had uh, a lot of really interesting ideas about uh, data management associated with shared use facilities, which I think is a, is a real opportunity. I'll say a few words about that later. Gerald Lopez, who unfortunately can't be here today, but uh, he is the uh, director of the, the SING Nano Center. John Eibarger, you'll meet later. Um, and uh, very importantly, and I'll get onto this a little bit later in the, in the talk, Mathieu Rampon, who is actually a software engineer who developed uh, our system called NEMO, which is the, the system that we use for managing uh, clean room access. All right, so um, why not should you pay any attention to anything I have to say? So I just wanted to give you a little bit of background. Um, so. I was thinking about this. Uh, there's, a, there's an experience that I, I, I did not put on here, which was as a grad student, uh, I was uh, peripherally, peripherally engaged in the, in the clean room that we were building at Oxford at the time. Um, and that was probably a, a really good lesson in uh, why it's essential to pay close attention uh, when that clean room opened. They managed to switch the airflow so that instead of it being a positive pressure, it was at negative pressure. And every time you open the door, a whole little flock of dust bunnies would run <laughs> into the clean room. So, needless to say, for the first couple of years until that was resolved, our, our results were less than less than perfect. So, um, when I was at so, so my background is is advanced lithography. That's what I did at, at Bell Labs for many years. But when I moved to Lawrence Berkeley Lab. I took over the uh, evening facility in the Center for X-ray Optics and actually opened that up and made that into much more of a user facility than a sort of a, a captive uh, fabrication operation. And then uh, when the DOE funded the Nanoscale Science Research Centers, I was director of the nanofabrication facility and the molecular foundry involved in 
actually the sort of the very beginning of the architectural design, construction, and then eventual fit out of that uh, of that facility. I've been chair for more years than I can to remember of the scientific advisory board at uh, the Brookhaven Nano Center. I've done the triennial reviews for the Argonne Nano Center um, from its inception uh, through the present day. And then when I moved to NIST, I was in on the ground floor of the Center for Nanoscale Science and Technology. Having had so much fun with the stand-up in the molecular foundry, I decided to do the, the sort of the same thing all over again. Um, and right now, I uh, am chief of the microsystems and nanotechnology division at NIST. So still have a very close engagement with that facility. Uh, again, the one is Rob's boss. Um, but I do interact with him uh, very closely on that. Uh, you know, so I've had experience both as a user and an operator of shared use facilities. So um, one question that always comes up is, well, why should we have a shared use facility? Um, and hopefully the answer is, is obvious to this audience, but I think it bears repeating. Um, and certainly what we find at NIST, um, you know, despite our lavish government funding, is that the cost of acquisition of state-of-the-art tools is really prohibitive for any single PI. And in addition to that, the cost of ownership uh, can also be absolutely crushing. That cost of ownership includes not just the facilities, but the service contracts, and really importantly, the staffing. Um, so one of the lessons that I took from my time at Berkeley Lab when I was in the Center for X-ray Optics was that we had a, a, a reasonably high-end EV lithography tool. Um, that tool was capable of running 24-7. Um, and the challenge was feeding it, was having enough people bring research projects, enough people to actually you know, how to operate the system so that we could keep it running for uh, as much time as possible and generate as much research output as we possibly could. Um, you know, that, after all, is one of the, one of the functions. Um, and obviously, in a shared use facility, you have the opportunity to, to bring together multiple tools. So, you know, in the context of an imaging facility, for example, you know, a couple of different kinds of TEM, SEM, focused ion beam, and so on, together bring uh, a great deal more capability than uh, a single tool on its own. And obviously, in the context of a nanofabrication facility, you know, lithography without that position and etch is, is kind of a meaningless experience. Um, so it really is important to bring the right tool set together. And then you're in a situation where the whole is much, much greater than the, than the sum of the parts. And I won't talk about it a lot here, but as you build out a facility, really thinking through carefully the interactions between the different tools that you want to put in the facility, do you have the necessary supporting tools? And again, going back to my time as a, as a, a student at Oxford, we had um, very, a couple of very well-known professors in electron microscopy. The electron microscope companies would uh, generally donate the, the state-of-the-art tools to us. But we were lacking in sample preparation equipment, so we would have these beautiful, capable machines sitting there um, with a real shortage of specimens to put in them. So uh, I always like to emphasize that there's a whole selection of small, relatively inexpensive sort of productivity tools that allow you to sort of keep feeding and operating the larger, more expensive systems. And then obviously, if you have an open shared use facility, um, it enables you to get the most out of the investment. Again, um, you know, just catching the, the end of the previous presentation, this is going to be a very substantial investment for Yale. Clearly, you want to get the most out of it. So, um, operating the facilities is in an open a fashion as possible while still maintaining uh, their ability to operate is going to be uh, it's going to be key. All right, so um, there are an awful lot of decisions that you have to make when uh, contemplating a shared use facility. Um, and the first question may seem like a very obvious one, but you know what is the purpose of the shared use facility? And um, you have to answer the question, who is it supposed to serve? What community are you trying to support with this shared use facility? And it's not necessarily uh, an easy answer. Um, you know, if you try and be all things to all people, 
then you will probably wind up in a, in a suboptimal uh, configuration. So, you know, questions around what do you want to include in that facility, um, and that involves not just the equipment, but the staffing and so on. Um, and then what are you going to leave out? Uh, you know, none of us have uh, infinite resources to hand, so deciding exactly how you're going to spend them and how you're going to, to utilize them over the long term is really important. Something that we have encountered both at NIST and at the DOE now at centers is uh, you know, a set of metrics that are typically imposed on us by the funding agencies. Um, and uh, in, you know, particularly in the, in the DOE context, um, you know, there's a lot of drive associated with those metrics. The same would be true of some of the NSF-funded centers. But if you have the ability to choose your own metrics, um, then that is something that I would highly recommend because it gives you, not only does it give you something to work towards, but it helps drive sort of the overall behavior and function of, uh, of your facility. Um, so uh, one of the things I, I talk about in the, uh, in the paper is, you know, don't just look at user numbers. So for example, it is possible to have a very large number of very unhappy users. Um, I think we've all been in that situation, um, you know, where the facility is crowded, people are not able to get their work done. So yes, it's great, you've got a lot of users, but they're not really enjoying the uh, enjoying the situation. Um, and we're always asked to distinguish between outputs and impacts. So you know, great, you're publishing a lot of papers, but are they good papers? Are they papers that actually lead to some meaningful uh, impact? And I know John has some uh, really nice statistics for the NIST Boulder Clean Room, uh, where they've done an analysis and capturing the the sort of the, the scientific impact of the facility itself. Um, obviously, one key question is how much is it going to cost, and then associated with that, who's going to pay for it, and who's going to pay for it not just today but in the future. And that's uh, a topic that I'll return to uh, a little later in the talk. Um, so. Uh, you know, you have to set up your facility, and really, the challenge here is is how do you design it to be fit for purpose? So, um, the the first facility that I worked in at uh, at Berkeley Lab, we had uh, what was then a reasonably state of the art UV lithography tool in a in a very tiny clean room. Uh, the rest of our fabrication facility uh, was. Uh, was relatively modest. We had a two-chamber edge system, an SEM, and AFM, a couple of other things. A popcorn ceiling, which I would not recommend as a, as a particularly clean environment. But I will say that in that <coughs> context, we never lost a sample due to particular contamination. Um, you know, we lost them by dropping wafers, uh, by messing up on the design, by missing a process that so it is perfectly possible to produce high quality output. We did produce high quality output, I did just want to say that. Uh, we produce high quality output uh, without going all out in terms of the quality of the facility. Um, when we set up the, uh, the clean room and the molecular foundry at, uh, at Berkeley Lab, we worked with uh, a number of different architects, um, including Abby Gray, who was terrific, but um, their approach was sort of very much based on industrial high quality clean rooms, which was way beyond what we needed because again, we're not in the business of producing uh, you know, high yield chips, but being able to do research. Um, and in that situation, we were able to say, all right, you know, somewhere between a class 100, class 1000 clean room is perfectly adequate for everything we're doing. Again, we're not losing yield due to particular contamination. We want a situation where the facility is as open as possible, um, and the, bar the literally the barrier to entry is minimized. So, um, you know, trying to keep down protocols and so on at a level that is not going to uh, going to deter people. There are a few folks who enjoy being in a bunny suit all day, um, <coughs> or several days, or they being one of them. Um, but not everybody really enjoys that uh, very much. So if you can get away with sort of smocks and caps, 
um, and still do what you need to do, uh, it makes it a much more inviting place to work. It is also going to keep your operating costs down. So, you know, there is a considerable difference in cost between operating a class 1,000 facility versus a class 1 facility just in energy consumption for air handling, for example. So those are kind of uh, some things to think about when you scope uh, a, a fabrication facility um, and decide what it is you're trying to do. You know, if you're Intel, yield is important. You want the highest clean class you can possibly get. If you're a research fab, the same yield drivers that affect Intel do not affect you. Um, you know, it's much more about training people to use the tools correctly, making sure people design things correctly and so on, that they understand process flows and so on. Um, and all of that uh, sort of leads into the cost of operation. How much is it going to cost you to operate the facility? You know, what do you need in terms of, I've already mentioned air handling, but the eye water flows, so uh, sizing tools appropriately so that you do not consume large amounts of resources. And of course, there's always a balance there in terms of uh, looking out and making sure that you have capacity for the future, um, but that you're not sort of spending a fortune maintaining that capacity for a long time before it gets used. And, and we've actually just gone through a very painful example in our NIST clean room, and I know John's gonna smile at this. Um, we invested in some eight inch furnaces, uh, despite the fact that everything we do is on four inch wafers, but for reasons that I won't get into, we decided that it was important that we have an, uh, a 200 millimeter path through our, our fab. We bought the furnaces from a vendor who uh, went out of business shortly thereafter. Um, so installation was spread out over a couple of years. The furnaces were never really commissioned properly. They consume an absolutely enormous volume of nitrogen uh, just to flush them. So the operating cost is enormous. Um, and they don't work. <laughs> and, and they cost us an absolute fortune. Um, and very, very painfully, we donated our fabulous four-inch tubes to the Boulder Clean Room, where they are now operating really, really well. Um, so you know there are there are things to watch out for um, in in the in that sense um, you know and, and again the, the sort of I don't want to go on about wafer size too much but um, you know there are some choices to make there um, and, and in my sort of uh, second job as as a, sort of an advisor on the R and D program for the Chips Act we're hearing a lot from companies for example. You know, if you're a, a 3.5 manufacturer, or do you, do you upgrade to 8 inch? It's kind of expensive, are the substrates available? Um, you know, there's sort of a, a, a bit of a gap in the market around 200 millimeter tools currently, because, you know, sort of the, the big fabs have all moved to 300 millimeter, 200 millimeter is kind of a legacy. Um, so are you going to be able to get a reasonably state-of-the-art tool at the wafer size that you select, for example? And what is that going to look like in the future? You know, what is the path of upgrading you need to, to be able to do that? Um, and then one of my favorite topics, recap. Um, the DOE nanosensors were originally set up with no recap budget. Um, and it doesn't take a, a genius to figure out that, um, you know, as wonderful as your first tranche of tools are in your clean room, uh, at some point they age out. Uh, so you need to factor in some sort of depreciation cost. Um, a reasonable number is 10%. You know, if I had my choice, I would probably go for 15% a year. Um, but building that into your operations budget is absolutely critical if you want to maintain capability over the long term. And again, in the context of the DOE nanosensors, uh, despite the fact that every single review committee said you guys really need a recap budget. They didn't do anything for about 15 years. And then the answer was, you know what, guys? You need to just save 10% of your budget and devote that to recap, um, which led to some very painful actions in uh, some of the DOE nanosensors. Because if you just need to suddenly reserve 10% of your budget, which you are currently fully spending, um, that means letting people go. And that happened in some places. So. Um, 
uh, at the bottom I have who pays, um, and I'll talk a little bit more about setting up a sort of a financial model for the clean room, particularly from the user side, because this is a an off-debated and frequently highly contentious topic. I have some firm views on the subject. Um, and interestingly, the, the Gaithersburg and Boulder clean rooms. Yes, John. Are you about to be contentious or just? Uh, no, not, not, well, hopefully not contentious. So, just a quick question on, uh, you mentioned the 10% number. Are you talking about the annual budget or on the, uh, the total uh, capitalized equipment base? So ideally on the total capitalized equipment base, um, you know, which as time progresses, hopefully is getting larger and larger. Um, so yeah, and you know, it will be that depreciation time, that sort of uh, time of replacement for the tools will vary tool by tool. Uh, you know, there are some uh, pieces of equipment that can can do a good job for 10 or 15 years. You know, the, the state of the art capability hasn't really shifted that much. Um, some of them age out just due to lack of support. So um, this may be uh, a somewhat shocking statement, but the resolution capability of even lithography tools hasn't changed in about 40 years. Um, so you know, if you can keep your system running, it's probably fine. Um, on the other hand, um, we uh, we did some special modifications to our tool at Berkeley Lab, and I don't know if anybody in the room remembers OS2 Warp from IBM, which was an operating system that was popular for about six months. Um, we chose to build the system out on that. <laughs> I, you can laugh, it was painful. Um, <laughs> um, you know, so just people develop enthusiasms for things, particularly around home-built systems, and, and sometimes it's, it's good to just say, you know, no, we're gonna go with the, you know, the, the fully supported software. Anyway, um, so the you know the, the financial model is something uh, you know sort of there's the there's the the operator side, but there's also the user side. It's a really important decision because it can uh, really change the way people use the facility, um, and depending on what it is you're trying to achieve, um, you know you, you might want to pick a, a different financial model. And then last of all, uh, you know, who's responsible and who's in control? So, um, you know, as, as an occasional operator of a fab, you would really like to be in charge of what goes on. It, I will talk about oversight in a little bit. It's really important to have oversight, but, you know, the person who's responsible for the functioning of the facility, I think, should largely be in control. Uh, there should be advisory committees and so on, but um, I have certainly seen, uh, particularly in the academic setting, situations where um, you know, a group of faculty is in control and then sort of forcing a set of not necessarily ideal decisions on the operator of the facility, and then that leads to uh, issues down the road and, and a lot of conflict. All right, so um, construction, equipment acquisition, and operation. Um, I cannot emphasize the first bullet enough. Um, you know, pay for and listen to the experts. Uh, when we went through the construction of the molecular foundry clean room, as I mentioned, we worked with several different uh, clean room experts and got the sort of the full range of opinions from you know, build plates of this is what you would do in an industrial fab to make sure you have a facility that can, you know, yield chips to, eh, you know, just put a hat and a smock on and, and you'll be fine. Uh, and, you know, we settled somewhere in the middle of that, um, came up with, uh, I think, some innovative uh, construction approaches just to sort of keep the cost down, simplify the layout, um, you know, make sure that the, both the operating and maintenance costs were, uh, were supportable in that context. Um, talk to as many people as you possibly can. Fortunately, there is a, a, a relatively large community of folks out there with uh, experience of operating shared use facilities of all shapes and sizes, serving all sorts of different communities. Um, and, you know, they have a wealth of experience, <coughs> something that you've been familiar with the UGIM meeting, which is a, 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 
place for folks to get together and share experience on this sort of thing. Um, plan for long-term success. Um, I have seen situations where frequently, um, you know, there's an initial large tranche of funding. Everybody gets really excited. You build a nice new building. Then the funding for equipping that building is maybe a little less, and then for getting the tools is less still, and then for the operating budget is sort of almost zero. And that will lead to a lot of very unhappy people. Um, you know, some donor will get their name on the building, but is it really producing anything? Um, very importantly, decide what is appropriate for your situation. Um, you know, everyone is different in terms of what they're trying to accomplish. And I have here, you know, determine the mission or missions um, you know, in the context of our NIST clean room. Our mission is to advance the NIST mission, um, and that means being able to deliver on research projects. We do work for other agencies, which means those research projects come with a firm timeline and a budget. Um, and that drives some of the way that we equip and operate our clean rooms. For an academic institution, Delivering on research projects, those funded by other agencies may be important, but clearly you have an educational mission too. So um, you know, how are you going to plan to structure the facility and the operations to allow both to occur? And you know, it's not necessarily a bad idea to divide things up into one or uh, two or more sections that allow you to have, uh, for example, tools that people can learn on and tools that operate stably so that you can actually carry out processes that you need to on a regular basis. And I would say in the context of the CHIPS Act, we've had lots and lots of discussion um, with companies and researchers about uh, open source process design kits, for example, which are basically the rules for how you should instantiate a circuit design uh, into, a, into a physical uh, construction. And uh, I had somebody say, well, you know, we should get the, the university fabs and the, and the government labs to have their own process design kits, at which point I nearly fell out of my chair, because the level of stability that you need in a process to be able to publish a process design kit is, that's what Intel does. That's not what we're going to do in a research fab. But um, having sort of baseline process flows, uh, processes that are robust, that people who want to build a device, not research a process, will need to hand. So, you know, if you're doing MEMS, for example, you want a reliable deep silicon edge. We had a, an example recently where somebody, a, a, a grad student, decided to put PDMS, which is rubber, in one of our etches, and that took the system down. I can see a couple of people blanching at the prospect. Uh, but that took that system down for six months. Um, so you know, ensuring process segregation in your fab is really critical. Um, next point, invest the right amount of time and, and money. Um, and importantly, you know, scope what you want to do for the resources that you think you will have available. So again, there are folks who tend to want to, you know, want to go really big, and that's great, but if you don't have the long-term support to do that, um, then ultimately you are again going to have a community of, of really unhappy users. And then hire good people. Um, this is absolutely critical. Um, you know, running a shared use facility is difficult. Um, and again, particularly in, a, in an academic environment, you have sort of multiple demands on you, different things that you're trying to do. Uh, it requires a lot of expertise, uh, frequently a great deal of patience. Um, you know, again, somebody puts PDMS in an etcher, um, you know, you might want to turn off the monitoring cameras and they'll have an accident, but you can't do that. Um, you, know, you have to educate them and explain why this is not a good thing. Um, and then uh, uh, something a friend of mine used to say, you know, remember, if you offer peanuts, you'll get monkeys. Um, so, you know, it is worth paying a little bit extra to get some really good people with not only the, the right technical expertise, but the right attitude for operating a shared use facility. Um, you know, if you are in the business of letting more or less random people come in and play on millions of dollars worth of equipment, you really have to have the right attitude towards education, to be patient, um, to be alert and observant, 
um, for, uh, for, a, uh, for a facility like that to operate. All right, so I think I've probably emphasized this often, uh, but not often enough, which is you know, being penny wise and pound foolish uh, leads to disaster. So in terms of operating costs, there is always a really strong temptation to try and minimize the operating costs, operate with a skeleton crew, uh, not pay for service contracts because they are expensive. Um, but what happens? You know, you, your year's warranty runs out, the instrument performance degrades, there's a fight over who pays for the repair, and it's expensive because you're going a la carte. Um, your research projects fail, um, and um, you know, PIs abandon the facility and go elsewhere, so now they're spending money to use somebody else's facility, or just not being able to do the work. Um, your costs are likely unchanged, I mean, you still own the facility, you still have to pay the staff, um, and that really is the worst of all worlds, um, and you know, it, it does happen. Um, so really, um, you know, I can't emphasize it enough how important it is to scope what you do to the available budget and make sure that the available budget um, well, is not just stable, but ultimately is going to be increasing over the years uh, in, in line with inflation, which again in this business uh, is typically greater than the, uh, the average rate. Um, governance is something I also wanted to mention. Um, putting the right governance structure in for a shared use facility is absolutely critical. Um, you want oversight, you want outside experts coming and taking a look. I think this is true for almost every operation. Um, you become close to it and then you develop blind spots. Um, and just having folks come in and take a look and give you advice, and, you, know, you don't have to take the advice, but at least you'll get a different perspective, is really critical. Um, so the kinds of, of advisory boards that I think are important, and you know, there's, there's no magic here, almost every uh, user facility has something along these lines, is you, know, you want a scientific advisory board to help um, give you a different perspective on strategic directions, um, you know, what's happening in for example, the semiconductor industry, you know, where is that going? We've all heard a lot about the CHIPS Act, as I mentioned, I'm sort of deep in the middle of it. Um, there is a tremendous amount of opportunity, but, you know, for example, for NIST, for an academic facility, where are the right places where you might be able to contribute and you want to be able to have a sit down conversation with folks from industry, for example, who really know what's going on can, and can tell you about those opportunities. Um, Having a user committee, uh, folks who are in your shared use facility day to day and can bring to your attention you know, issues with those day to day operations. You know, is your financial model working? Is your sort of system for reservations working? Um, you know, is there a particularly troublesome user that other folks would like you to take action over? Um, all kinds of things like that. Um, equipment procurement is always a big thing because Typically, we're talking about big ticket items. Um, there is a sort of strategic component to that. So, um, you know, if there is a, a new technology coming along, or, you know, because you've taken a look at the, at the lifetime of all the tools in your facility, you know when they're aging out. Um, you know, you want to plan for that as far in advance as possible. Um, every time something does age out, should it be a direct replacement? Are there new capabilities on offer? Do you want to change the mix of the tools? And, in your facility over time. So that's really useful. And then when it comes down to, yes, we're going to buy this new whatever it is, um, you know, convene a group of experts to really dig into it because typically there will be more than one option available, um, you know, with slightly different characteristics, uh, different operating costs and so on, different learning curves. Again, if you're in a, you know, if you're in a facility where you're going to allow a large community of people to operate a tool as opposed to having a tool operate. So those are things to think about. So, you know, bring together a group around that individual acquisition um, and, again, get as much advice as you possibly can. Ask people who already have one, you know, does this thing work? Does it break down over a couple of weeks? Um, you know, lots of things look good on paper. Not so good once you actually get them into the fab. And I see John smiling. Um, you know, I'll go back to our furnaces. They look great on paper. Um, not so good in practice. 
Um, I shouldn't have to mention safety, but I'm going to mention safety. Um, again, um, you know, when you're close to a facility operation, um, you know, you take safety very seriously, but it is easy to develop blind spots. So in the case of our clean rooms, we bring in people uh, from you know, a variety of other operations uh, on a periodic basis to just walk through, take a look at our procedures and our systems, and we get a lot of good advice from them. Um, and in terms of operating costs and, and setup costs, you know, safety systems are expensive, but they are really important. Um, so they range from things like the toxic gas monitoring system to um, surveillance cameras. So we have a system of high definition surveillance cameras throughout the clean room. There is no part of the space that is not covered by cameras. Um, and those, uh, that set of cameras also connects to the NIST fire department. So you know, at the out of hours operation, there is, in principle, somebody always watching and available. Um, we haven't had any incidents where you know, somebody's collapsed on the floor and they've been spotted through the cameras, which is good. But we have been able to go back and review video and say, so here's the person who left the unlabeled beaker of HF in the fume hood. Uh, you know, which results in a, in a fairly serious conversation. Um, and hopefully they never do it again. Um, so, all right, so uh, financial models and operation, there are, as I say, a whole variety of different financial models for shared use facilities, ranging from what I'll call fee for service, so, you know, basically pay by the hour, um, cat, and that cat can be large or small, depending, um, to open access. I used to call this free, and people had a, a real issue with the word free, but, um, you know, somebody pays for it. Um, and this is a really useful debate to have, and it's also tied to, well, you know, how are you going to operate the facility, because that's going to uh, have an impact on how much money you need. So. In the case of um, the NIST Gaithersburg clean room, we operate in what I would call a fully staffed model, and I'll show you details of the, of the staffing level in a few minutes. Um, but we, in that operation, expect the tools to be maintained, a certain set of baseline processes to be maintained, and have the facility more or less ready to go when folks come in. Um, John, I'm sure, will we'll mention the model for the Boulder clean room, but that is uh, a smaller staff and sort of super users who help maintain the tools. And then, of course, there are the, the university models where it's just a free-for-all, and you know you expect the students to learn by changing pump oil and stuff, but you're not going to get a lot of great output in terms of the actual research that gets done. Um, I am actually a, a fan of the open access or small cap model. Um, again, you made a very substantial investment in the facility and the tools and so on. Getting the maximum output from it, um, I think, is, is a, a worthwhile goal. Uh, and what we have found with our clean room, which is currently operating on a fee-for-service model, is it it suppresses demand, and, and NIST actually has economists, so I went to, to talk to um, some of our, our economists trying to figure out what we should do about the financial model for the clean room, and I was describing the situation, and, and you'll see from data a little bit later, that um, yeah, there's actually plenty of headroom in terms of clean room capacity. Again, everything is capable of operating 24-7, so yes, you know, Students, for example, generally like to come in after lunch, um, and you know there's the time between lunch and a late dinner. But there are a lot of other hours in the week that are available for, for operation. Um, and by having a, a sort of a pay-as-you-go model, well, you know I I know I've got to do this etch, and it's going to take an hour, and that's going to cost me fifty bucks, and I really should do the chamber clean for another thirty minutes. Well, that's another $25, and my PI is going to get kind of annoyed if I keep spending that money. So I'm going to skip the chamber clean. Um, and then 
The next person coming in, well, I don't know whether this tool has been properly cleaned, but I'm going to run my sample anyway because I don't want to run a clean and pay the 25 bucks. And then my sample doesn't work. Um, and you can quickly see how that turns into a disaster because now the tools aren't operating quite stably because nobody wants to do the cleans on them because it's costing them extra and so on. Um, if you have a, um, a new process to develop, for example, you will want to run a design of experiments, but if you pay for every single one of those, then the, the temptation is to say, well, you know, I'm just going to kind of ballpark the conditions here and throw my sample in and hope for the best. Um, that is not helpful in terms of education and training, and it's certainly not helpful in terms of getting good quality research output. So uh, for those reasons, <laughs> I'm a fan of either you know, sort of a, a modest cap fee, um, you know, some people say, well, it's kind of like putting the velvet rope up at a club, it keeps the riffraff out. Um, you know, you don't want just sort of people who are very casual users to show up. Uh, you know, people, uh, you want people who are, who are um, serious and engaged to show up. Um, but you do want people to use things the way they are, should be used in order to, to sort of make sure that your processes and operation are as stable as possible, and people are getting trained correctly in how to do fabrication or imaging, whatever it is. All right, so um, I see I'm sort of getting along in time. And again, please do interrupt with questions. I just wanted to run through our fab very quickly, just so you could get an idea of, of our facility and show you uh, sort of some of the data that we've, uh, we've managed to collect from it. This is our, our basic uh, clean room layout. It's about 19,000 square feet, about 8,000 square feet of class 100, so the standard day and chase operation. And you can see sort of the, the primary areas. The numbers in red there are what we estimate as the sort of the, the appropriate capacity for those areas. So, uh, you know, the total um, number of folks that the clean room can accommodate working productively at any one time. is on the order of 30 or so in this situation. We also have a separate part of the facility, which is our, our imaging and analysis uh, section, which is, is not shown on this. Um, just a, a little breakdown in terms of um, you know, some, some of the interesting statistics. Um, where we bucketed the uh, types of research projects into uh, you know, things like electronics or photonics or MEMS or bio and so on. So you can kind of see the distribution of, uh, of users. Um, and sort of the variability, um, if you look at the cost data, in terms of the resources that they are using. So for example, folks are, who are doing electronics uh, or photonics typically use a lot of eating time, which is expensive currently. Um, the bio folks tend to do much simpler sort of microfluidics, PDMS molding, and that sort of thing, uh, which tends to be uh, tends to be less expensive. Um, and again, all this data is, is in the paper, so if folks are interested in the, in the deep dive, it, it is available. Uh, so I said for the Gaithersburg clean room, um, we operate on a sort of a fully staffed model. Um, and our goal here is to enable the largest number of people to be able to deliver on their research programs uh, you know, effectively and in a timely fashion. So uh, I know some folks will look at this and go, wow, that's, you know, that's pretty luxurious. Um, on the other hand, we have scoped and sized this according to our mission, uh, which does not necessarily mean that this kind of model is appropriate for your mission. Um, and you'll see that each staff person has a primary responsibility and a secondary responsibility because people take vacation. Um, so, you know, we need to make sure that, uh, you know, everything is, is covered uh, when our users come in. Also mentioned that at least pre-COVID, uh, we used to serve a fair number of external users um, and those folks are coming in um, paying full freight. So, you know, they expect things to be up and running and available to them, not to be, uh, uh, to fix it, not to be fixing tools and uh, re-establishing baseline <coughs> um, 
not surprisingly, labor dominates the operating expenses. Um, you know, so I have labor and labor overhead, and obviously your overhead may differ. Um, but equipment maintenance is a good chunk. Um, service contracts are fairly large. Um, and bizarrely enough, at NIST, we pay an overhead on purchasing equipment. Um, and that's a conversation for another day. Um, <laughs> it's very, very painful. Um, you can see uh, the breakdown cost of acquiring the tools. So to John's point, uh, you know, is your recap budget 10% of your annual operating costs? or is it 10% of your total installed base of tools? 10% of the total installed base is appropriate. Um, so you can see that unloaded, uh, we're looking at around $6 million a year, ideally, um, to recapitalize the facility, which is, I see a few people going, um, but yeah, no, I mean, that's, that's a realistic number. Um, you won't always get it, but I think, you know, as you go to sort of deans and provosts, some people, I would be very upfront and say, look, you know, this is what it takes to keep a facility operating. Um, you know, not necessarily the state of the art, but just at the, you know, at a reasonable level. Um, service contracts, you know, kind of your choice. Um, some tools, it is absolutely essential. Uh, some tools, if you have a couple of good maintenance technicians, Maybe you don't need it. Sometimes that can be better because they're right there when the tool breaks. Um, service contracts, always an interesting conversation. You know, we offer 48 hour service response. Well, does that mean this individual shows up in your clean room with a bag of tools ready to go? Or does it mean, we'll answer your phone call within 48 hours? Um, you laugh, we've had that. Um, <laughs> Uh, what parts does it cover? You know, there are some consumables, and I use the con word consumables advisedly, that are really, really expensive. Um, you know, you can get service contracts that include those or not. Installation, that is uh, a very large number. Um, we used to operate on a model where we would contract out the installation of tools to a third party. Uh, what we have done much more recently is to either make installation part of the purchase contract for the tool, um, or we do it ourselves. So it turned out we were paying an absolute fortune to run um, gas lines. Well, for I think $60,000 you can buy an orbital welder for gas lines, and for about the same you can have a crew of five people trained to operate it. Now we can do all the toxic gas plumbing for our tool installations ourselves. Um, and you know, you get that certified after it's been put in, but that was an enormous cost saving for us. So again, something to, to think about. Um, <clears throat> this is just a, a timeline of uh, the tools that we have installed, the, the blue and orange are just for, um, to allow you to, to, to see the years more clearly. Things in gray are things that uh, we have retired. So you can see you know, a very large number of tools. Some of these are major, and some of these fall into more of that category of productivity tools, you know, just the little bits and pieces of equipment. Um, you know, it's really frustrating if you can't keep your e-beam operate, uh, e operating because you don't have enough hot plates to bake resists, for example. That's you know, a really false economy. Um, we do a lot of work with even lithography uh, where we want to put a conductive coating down on the resist film um, to make sure that we get uh, you know, the best possible uh, placement accuracy. <coughs> it makes no sense to tie up a million dollar sputter tool when you can use a $50,000 tabletop sputter to achieve the same effect. Um, again, roughly how long after 2005 did you um, on the order of 10 years, I mean, some things limp along longer than they should. Um, you know, again, it depends what kind of recap budget you have available, and also how the research needs are evolving over time. Um, you know, there are some areas that are particularly hot, and maybe they need a, a special tool, and then after a, a few years, you know, 
nobody's uh, nobody's interested in that anymore, or there's something new with just much much better capability that you want to uh, want to install. Um, so you know we keep going, um, and you can see the the last two items there: uh, upgrades to the nitrogen and DI water were multi-million dollar efforts. Um, when the clean room was built originally, the DI water system was not sized appropriately. Um, and you know, as we installed, uh, particularly some more automated tools, um, the DI water usage went way up. Um, and I think that was somewhere between a three and four million dollar upgrade to, uh, to resize the DI water plant. Um, so again, you know, I said earlier, scope the facility, you know, for the future, but also for what you can afford. And there's a, you know, there's obviously a, a tension between uh, those things. Yes. So I noticed that uh, from 2018, 2019, there's no new tool installation. Was that just because it was not updated, or was there a pandemic going on? What, what's going on? It, partly it's the pandemic. Partly it's the nature of the way that funding <coughs> works um, in the government is uh, and at NIST. You know, Congress is our funding agency. That's who we apply to. And I see John smiling. Um, Riley. Um, you know, it's, it's always a little bit uncertain as to if there'll be a budget. And, you know, there are initiatives that get proposed. And some years, you know, everybody's like, yes, science is really important. Cool. We should do that. And then the University of Alabama will get a new clean room with NIST funds. Um, not that they shouldn't, but um, pork is back in a big way. Um, so yeah, it can it can be really variable. Uh, you know, we had the uh, American Recovery and Reinvestment and Act up after the 2008 financial crisis, which was great. We got a lot of new tools, um, and you know, hopefully, there's funding in the Chips Act that will allow us to do a refresh. But you know, it's sort of a decadal. There's a crisis, and then there's money available, which allows us to recap, which is really not ideal. Um, I will also say that when those big chunks of money come in, it is really tempting to buy a lot of shiny, expensive things that come with huge service contracts. And then suddenly, two or three years later, people go, oh my god, you know, we can't afford this. And again, in the government, um, you know, there's been a nearly 5% cost of living adjustment in salary. So for my division, which is about a $20 million a year budget, I now have to find an extra million dollars a year out of my discretionary spending because I can't. I mean, I don't want to, but I, you know, I can't lay people off. Um, so we face a number of challenges along those lines. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm sure if we went back and looked at the sort of equipment acquisitions, there would be sort of big chunks where um, you know these these blocks of funding show up and then long quiet periods. Yes. You said you do your own welding. Mm -hmm. Do you uh, inspect the welds with a bore scope and have your uh, welds cut out on a regular basis to make sure that they're, they're meeting the expectations? I am assuming that whatever is necessary is done, but that's a question that Rob would be able to answer. Um, but yeah, I mean, we haven't had any issues. I don't, John, do you have any comment on that? Yeah, I guess I, I could say, and I know, I know in Boulder, we've been a lot of our guys that's come through the uh, this way block training and certified and things. And yeah, every morning, he, you know, he does a weld. You know, dices it up, you know, takes a look at it, inspects it, makes sure it's good, and then goes through and signs his wells. He's got a well block, you know, all the all the things you want to do. And then we always do the alien like checking on them and things like that. Do you that. actually do the bore sculpt of the well you actually do, though? I and don't so actually know if he does that. That's a good question. Should. Yeah, it sounds like it. I lost 400 wells once that way because we were doing the same thing. And uh, so it's it's just important to take a look at those wells. I know you're certifying well, but. Uh, mm -hmm. You let you look at the wells that you're actually cut, that you have in place. Yeah, no, that's a, that's a good suggestion. We just a, a quick thing on the on the on the model of how how um, the CNSD Nanofab sort of had done all of their uh, installations. They had sort of you know outsourced them. We were on the opposite side of that pendulum where we did everything inside, and uh, it's a lot of work. <laughs> So it's the flip side of it. So so Gaithersburg sort of oscillating towards us, and we're actually starting to outsource more things. So it's sort of an interesting 
uh, to figure out where we're actually going to end up. So uh, it's it's when I saw your installation budget, <coughs> the capital cost of your tools is clearly that you're doing something that isn't using external people that often because your install budgets are actually pretty well considering yeah. what you're putting in. If you're putting in fifty million dollars of equipment for eight million, you're doing well. Yeah, as I say, some of that is because uh, you know the installation is built into the acquisition cost. Uh, but we did get burned once or twice with a couple of you know installation costs that were about the same price as, as the tool, and those were million dollar tools, and that was just you know ridiculous. And there's a whole discussion we could have about how the government contracts stuff out. But yes, hey Alex, uh, for the procurement of uh, new equipment. Uh, from your experience, is it a group decision or is it an individual decision? And how do you procure some equipment that may not actually be what is currently needed by the user, but a little bit more advanced? So that's really where having that strategic advisory group is essential, is to you know keep looking out. And you know, events such as this, you have vendors in, you know, going to conferences, seeing what the, the state of the arts is and so on. And talking to companies, seeing what the you know the next thing is going to be, um, and you know communicating that on a regular basis to the user community, I think is really helpful as well because frequently people will ask for what they're familiar with without knowing what the possibilities are. Um, so. Um, you know, without recommending or, or endorsing any company. You know, there have been a lot of advancements recently in nanoscale scale 3D printing, and there are a few different vendors out there. You know, each offers a slightly different set of capabilities and so on. Um, you know, even if you're an experienced nanofab person, it takes a while to digest that capability and think, well, all right, you know, if I had that available, what could I do with it? Um, you know, like, like any new tool, it takes a while to become familiar with it, and then longer to become truly creative with it. Um, so I don't know, does that help answer? But I think you know, sort of continually surveying what's coming and communicating that, you know, bringing people, you know, bring vendors in and have them give tutorials and stuff, uh, educate folks on uh, on what's possible. So anyway, I see I'm nearly out of time, so I did want to just. Um, cover Nemo for a second. So this is the software that we developed at NIST, which is our tool reservation, um, utilization, tracking. It does a lot of different things. So uh, we do access control with it. So tools and rooms can be interlocked. Um, access is, can be controlled on the basis of uh, individual users and projects uh, and so on. And you know, typically we don't grant anybody access until they have been fully trained and approved, and under our current model, you know, have an actual funded project. Uh, it allows us to manage reservations. So um, a lot of the pushback that we have had on our proposals for an open access model are, um, well, you know, what if the barbarian holds the sand and they tie up the tools, and you know, we can't get our work done. This is presuming that the barbarian hordes don't also have legitimate work to do. Um, at NIST, we have a very small number of barbarians, um, not really enough to constitute a horde. Um, <laughs> it, it's been really funny. Like, where are these people coming from? You know, we have a very limited number of people who know what to do in a fab, regardless. So, you know, it's not clear what we're guarding against. Um, but. We do have a tremendous amount of power with this reservation tool in terms of controlling the reservation policy by instrument, by project, by individual. So if you find somebody who is misbehaving and reserving large blocks of time, you can just turn that off. Um, you know, it's a, it's a very flexible uh, tool and it's a very easy problem to deal with. We also track all our maintenance issues through that so um, users can report problems with tools the staff uh, update the logs on those tools so that you can see, you know, yes, service call's been placed, we're waiting for a part, whatever it is, which is really helpful in terms of minimizing user frustration. Um, you know, I know we've all been on planes and the captain comes on and says, well, you know, we'll be here for some indeterminate period of time, and that's it, versus, um, 
I was flying out of Denver one time. Well, one of the ground crew got their hat sucked into the engine, and it's going to be 45 minutes before we take off. Um, you know, groans all around, but there's a definite timeline and a particular issue that's being dealt with, so you know, it, uh, it really helps folks uh, deal with frustration. Uh, we're able to track utilization, uh, which again is very helpful. Um, you know, so we get questions around, well, you know, what if this tool is fully booked 24 7? I'm like, great, we should budget for another one. Um, <laughs> Um, and then we, we've also uh, recently added sort of facility status, so you can see the temperature and humidity and so on in, in any of the operating environments. So you know, if you get some weird result and you can go look at the uh, room conditions and go, oh, okay, um, you know, the air handling was, uh, was out of whack. Um, the software is free. Um, I've been told by Rob that we're no longer calling it Nemo, but I don't know whether it now has a symbol for the software formerly known as. Um, <laughs> But uh, it is free to download, and you can sort of make your own instantiation of it. Um, and again, it, it is incredibly powerful. Uh, so let me just, I'll end on, on this slide. There's, there's uh, more data, but this is from my colleague, Jim Lau, uh, who is uh, a real proponent of making all of the data um, from a shared use facility accessible and usable. So uh, in the materials measurement laboratory, uh, which is where most of our electron microscopists reside, they've been working on a system called Nexus LIM, so it's a laboratory information management system, but it is now coupled with NEMO so that uh, every session on a tool is tagged with user data and sample and so on. And all of this is going into the SLIMS database. Um, and we have a fair number of machine learning folks at NIST who are now mining this data and, for example, training tools to recognize diffraction patterns and do materials analysis as a result. Um, and interestingly, a lot of the data that they are using was <coughs> not originally tagged by the users as being diffraction pattern data, but you know, with sort of additional bits and pieces of metadata that are available in part through NEMO, they are able to do that. So um, I'll make this the last slide. Um, you know, data from our, our system is really useful. <coughs> um, you know, ultimately knowledge is power. Uh, we were having issues with folks making lots of reservations in advance, and then other users were complaining that the tool was reserved, but you know nobody showed up. Um, so stern words were spoken, and that made a little bit of a difference, and then we started charging people for missed reservations, and that pretty much fixed the problem. Um, so being able to look at the data and see sort of cause and effect is, uh, is really powerful. Anyway, I have more slides that sort of just show more of the sort of data, um, and I'd be happy to discuss those in terms of the information that you can kind of mine from that. But it includes things like if there's an excessive number of maintenance hours on a particular piece of equipment, for example, well, you know, maybe there's a problem with that tool. Maybe you need to have a, a more in-depth conversation with the, uh, with the vendor and so on. Anyway, with that, thanks very much for your attention, and uh, I'd be happy to take any additional questions. The, the nitrogen upgrades, you mentioned you upgraded the nitrogen system two years ago. Uh, yes, so that I think was, a, was an on-site um, production capacity. So um, we were getting uh, <coughs> using a lot of nitrogen in not just the cleanroom facility, but in the advanced measurement lab complex as a whole uh, due to leakage and so on. So I think that was part of the upgrade again. I wasn't involved in that directly, but I can certainly get the uh, get the information on that. Um, but there are examples of new technologies where, for example, you can do on-site production of uh, certain gases. Um, you know, is it worth the expense of that in order to have a consistent supply and avoid waiting on deliveries? So that's a, a question you can ask about a facility. 
But I, I can ask and, and get some details on the uh, on the nitrogen upgrade. John, I don't know. Do are you familiar with the details on that? No, not not, not for Gatorsburg. I know Solar's had some set of issues, which I'll, I'll mention a little bit. David, for the Matt will actually talk about it. And Matt, yeah, Matt, that was yeah, talk about it. All right. Um, Uh, if you have more questions for Alex, uh, you can always come back to find him uh, in the lunch or during the dinner. Um, our next speaker is uh, John uh, from uh, East Colorado. Um, he is actually, well, his family used to be here, uh, maybe still here. I don't know. Uh, Grandparents, actually. Yes. Yeah, he, he, he graduated from the uh, University of Connecticut. Uh, he is recommended to us by Alex, and uh, he joined NIST in, uh, I think he rejoined uh, in 2010, and uh, has witnessed uh, the, the construction of the new film at NIST. Uh, um, yeah, without further ado, uh, let's welcome. Well, thank you. Thank you very much for, uh, for, for having me. Hopefully, I've got uh, some uh, some lessons learned from uh, from our from our experience, which is actually feels a little dated. It's, uh, it was from uh, 2012 is when we moved in, but it turns out clean rooms are still clean rooms. Are this you know, sort of a state of the art uh, late 80s, uh, you know, early 90s Intel fab level. So you know, it's uh, it, uh, it, it still work. So uh, yeah, so th this is the this is the space that we've got. So it's a um, uh, uh, imaging imaging space up in the uh, in the top uh, in the top part here on a corridor right across from the from the clean room and you can see where it sort of lives in the uh, where it lives in the building and then a nice uh, uh, fairly good size uh, eighteen thousand square foot clean room and something that I'm very uh, very always always excited about is that it's got a, just a massive impact on site so we have uh, about seven hundred fifty maybe eight hundred researchers at the NIST Boulder site, and about 60% of the site research passes through it in some critical way or another. And so uh, you know, entire research programs are based around it. And as you'll see in a, in, a, in, a, in a future slide, we've been around for a while too, so it was very sort of uh, 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 grassroots and uh, organically grown. So it started back in 1970. But um, uh, the, I guess I mentioned just a, just a hair more on the, on the imaging space. So we've got a, uh, an aberration corrected uh, uh, stem, a fib sem uh, atom probe, and also an extreme atom probe, which uh, instead of using a, uh, you know, a, a, a thermal emitter or a, uh, a UV laser, uses a high harmonic uh, generation laser to, uh, to excite, the, uh, excite the tip. And then, uh, and then the, uh, the fab here, got a nice uh, lithography suite with a couple steppers and an e-beam e -beam tool, you know, sort of all the things you'd expect. A uh, fairly large number of uh, deposition tools, and my dad uh, probably, uh, well, largely because of the um, uh, uh, materials uh, uh, purity and specificity requirements for, for, different, for different projects. Uh, and maybe very, very early on, I should mention, too, we're a captured facility for NIST staff and their direct collaborators. So uh, we're, not, uh, uh, we're not open to uh, outside, uh, outside users. Uh, very, uh, very, very different from the, uh, from the CNST nanofab model. And uh, probably the way that we can get away with this is because of this line right here. Everybody seems to use it, so it's very popular. So uh, yes, so a nice uh, a nice tool set, which is <coughs> going to actually undergo a, a nice uh, a nice bit of a refresh uh, associated with chips. So uh, we have um, uh, working working through the purchase uh, the purchase request. So uh, so the, the ink's not dry yet. But things are moving in a in a positive direction for for uh, for this type of upgrade. So uh, we're actually going to be adding yet another uh, another lab to the to the imaging. Facility and, uh, and having a nice, uh, nice layout of tools, and then uh, the, and then the clean room as well. And uh, I, until somewhat recently, only ran the clean room, but now I'm also in charge of the uh, uh, the imaging facility as well. So um, maybe just a real quick thing, you know, what do we do here? Well, we're NIST. We want to help support uh, uh, U.S. Uh, innovation, and industrial competitiveness, and things like that, and we want to be able to help measure things better. 
turns out when you measure things, you can do some cool science. So you know, won a Nobel, Nobel Prize or two associated with the clean room. And uh, just some, uh, some quick examples of some of the things that we're, that we're fairly, uh, fairly proud of. Uh, the voltage standard, for instance, this is, uh, looks like an Intel 8386 chip, actually. It's got about 300,000 Josephson junctions rather than, uh, than transistors. And uh, all of these need to work. They all need to have the same Shapiro steps, the same at the right uh, bias currents and things. And, uh, and so we're, we're able to, uh, to make this fairly, uh, fairly complicated chip in the, uh, you know, in the presence of uh, users who go, oh, but can I try this? And that's a very interesting, uh, a very interesting balance. Um, so uh, our, our roots really were in uh, superconductivity from back in the 70s. So uh, doing a lot of the, um, uh, the, the early groundbreaking work of using uh, Josephson junctions as a voltage standard, and then uh, somewhat quickly as, uh, using them as a, a squid, a superconducting quantum interference device. Uh, and then just a, a few of the little more quantum-based uh, uh, aspects, so some mac macroscopic entanglement here of some uh, mechanical, uh, mechanical states, and, uh, and then also uh, to, uh, ion traps, but then also integrating uh, single nanowire, uh, or superconducting nanowire, single photon detectors as well into, into such a structure. Um, so that, I think this is an interesting uh, comparison, actually. So the voltage standard, we've been making that. That's a 10-volt chip. Uh, this, uh, some of the early work that happened here was being made at the same time as the as a voltage standard. So this is maybe, maybe 2010 or so. And the first device that this group was able to make, this is John Tufel's group uh, and Joe Almentado, the first device they were able to make and yield, I think they got three nature papers out of. So it was really, really great you know, one-off chip that they managed to get working. Incredibly powerful and, you know, great science, but, you know, doing that alongside a, you know, a pretty, uh, fairly, uh, fairly complicated uh, you know, 10 to 15 lithographic layer process. So I mentioned we started, uh, we started a while ago, so back in the 70s, some researchers said, hey, we need some clean space, because you can, you can do a lot with, uh, 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 with that, and so that was, I was started back here in the 70s, sort of uh, grew organically over time. I say I managed to, we, we rebuilt it, we actually burned it down. Uh, when you build a clean room, um, make sure you have a fire alarm system. Apparently our building <laughs> didn't get back then. Um, we did have some researchers who were in, uh, who were in the space uh, when it happened. It was actually on Christmas Eve, I think at like 11 at night or something like that. Which, there you go, <coughs> researchers in there actually working. A lady across the street also saw flames coming out of the top of the building and you know, called the fire department. And it's all good. So that uh, uh, that uh, uh, resulted in an upgrade of the of the building, which had at the time six different wings, and uh, one wing then went, got a uh, sprinkler system added. Uh, the other ones actually got uh, uh, some detection. So the only wing that got the uh, the sprinklers, of course, was the one that we were in. So then uh, there was another expansion back in uh, in '99. In and uh, over the over the uh, you know these uh, 40, uh, 40 years, we were up to about uh, five thousand square feet, uh, gross square feet, and uh, we did as much as we possibly could in there. I, I should I should have found a picture for this. We had the uh, the load lock of a of a, of a Lesker uh, sputter uh, sputter tool, and the load lock arm actually was stuck into the uh, electronics rack of the next tool over. So, you know, trying to get everything as tight as possible in there. And uh, it was Boulder, so lots of people did yoga, uh, or still do yoga, of course. And so it was really handy to be able to get into these, into these spaces. So just not a lot of, not, not a lot of equipment, uh, not a lot of space. And so um, we uh, you know, obviously started thinking about, well, what, what would things look like uh, if we wanted to move to, uh, uh, to a, new, a new space? And of course, you know, this uh, this original space was uh, it was just converted lab space. It wasn't purpose built. It had relatively low uh, ceiling height. Uh, I think it was 14 or 15 feet. So we were able to get the air handlers and things up there for the research units. Uh, air handlers were on the u the roof. The gowning room was about 100 square feet, so we could get two people in there comfortably, which made interesting time when you had a fire alarm or you know, toast usually. Um, so, you know, tools were compressed, uh, you know, maintenance was difficult. We really only had one 
functional, maybe sort of two actually, uh, functional uh, chase spaces as well. So um, you're thinking about the future, like we should have, maybe we should have these things called chases. So um, of course, the easy answer is, oh, well, just build a new building, this would be great. So it took a long time. The first, the first thoughts were back in the, uh, back in the 90s. The, uh, the, the wonderful AML in Gaithersburg, I think, maybe used some of our designs and, uh, and maybe some of the funding. But you know, that's what happens when you're closer to DC, I guess, too. But, uh, but we did finally get, a, uh, uh, get, some, get some funding and a, and, a, and a solid design in 2007. And I'll go a little bit more into the, um, into the, into the timeline, but we moved in in 2012. So you know, a five-year time for you know, thinking about a building, getting it built, and moving in. It's actually a pretty, you know, uh, fairly, uh, fairly aggressive. And this is a picture of what that uh, lithography bay looked like, looked like before. And it actually reminded me a lot of sort of like a kitchen work triangle. You know, where you've got your, uh, you've got your, uh, you've got your fridge, your stove top, and your, uh, and your sink. You know, so we had the, uh, you know, we had our, uh, you know, our coat and uh, expose, and then develop. We're all, we're all right next to each other, which was, which was really handy. Which obviously we couldn't do that when we moved into the new space. The, um, so when we thought about, when we thought about our, uh, thought about the new clean room, we built. Uh, it was uh, designed to an H5. So um, and, and we had uh, zone segregation on all uh, on all three levels. The rest of the building is uh, is uh, is, a, is a B occupancy, and so it's sort of a building within a building. And uh, I don't know. Are you guys thinking about uh, an H five for the for the clean room, or are you going to keep it B? Just out of curiosity, for one of the design well, people. I don't think we've decided yet. Uh, okay. Well, uh, uh, I know the, uh, the University of Colorado right now is having some some challenges. They have a new clean a new clean room in a uh, uh, sort of a modest, you know, twenty five hundred square feet foot clean room in a uh, an existing B occupancy. And they're right now got a meeting later this week to chat about Silane. How how are they going to do that? Turns out it's not uh, it's not easy uh, in a uh, in a in a, in a B, not impossible, but just not easy. Um, so the um, Let's see. We, well, speaking about silane, we've got an ex exterior pad for for our silane gas. We uh, that's where we keep our hundred percent, our ten percent. We have in the uh, inside the clean room. The uh, we've got a, a nice uh, central utility plant which uh, runs the piping. And just as an example of, of something to think about, is uh, is uh, room for expansion. So in uh, in in the, well, 2007 when things were first were being designed, and even when we moved in in 2012. We didn't have money for, a, for an electron beam lithography tool, but we knew we really wanted one someday. So we built this really, uh, this really nice uh, purpose-built bay uh, adjacent to the uh, lithography room. So this is all class 100 that we stuck a uh, stuck our SEM in you know, for for the initial for the initial time until we were actually able to buy one. So we bought a, we bought a Joel, and then the, the SEM just got moved into a wall at the other at the other end. Um, the other, another nice piece is the uh, the two foot raised floor. So uh, we're slab on grade, so we've got a very nice, um, very nice uh, uh, vibrational, uh, uh, um, uh, quiet vibrationally. But the uh, the raised floor is really really handy from an installation perspective. We're we're running seems like we're running more and more things under the floor rather than through the walls to uh, to be able to get uh, to to be able to do the tool hookups. It's a really, really nice, uh, really nice aspect, uh, and of course, it's also that's also quite uh, quite clean because you get that line of flow all the way down. Um, so, uh, something I should uh, I should mention, you know, the, the the user model. I mentioned that we were a, a captured facility for NIST staff and their direct collaborators, and so um, we also have a very small uh, dedicated staff. So there's me and four. Uh, for full-time uh, staff people, so three technical and one administrative, actually, and uh, the rest of the work to cover an 18,000 square foot clean room is through is through users. It's a super user model. So, um, you know, typical typical research clean rooms in the in the U.S. have, have roughly one staff member per thousand gross square feet. It's exactly what the CNST is sitting at. Uh, not surprisingly, it was a good uh, good argument for that uh, for that level of funding. It's very appropriate. And we get by with the uh, with the rest of our uh, our staff in a super user model. So they're stewards of the tools. They're stewards to take care of it. I've got a slide later on the uh, on, on our model in more detail. But really, we wanted to think 
how are, how is the how are our users going to use the space? Right? If we, we've got like we've got a bay and chase design, are we going to have the, uh, the the chases considered sort of dirtier space where maybe you might just go in in a smock and then you know everybody you know working you know, work in the clean room? Well, no, we didn't want to do that. The researchers are actually also going to be going into the chases. They're going to be working on fixing tools and, and things like that. Um, we also had a uh, uh, had a, in, in a large part a, a, a bay and chase design. We did have a, a ballroom for the uh, for the lithography uh, for the lithography bay, and then um, and another another really uh, very useful one too is uh, creating a very nice large uh, uh, chase space. So we had uh, again, the old clean room I mentioned. We were sort of uh, starved of chase space, and. Uh, we, Really, really enjoyed having a uh, that all all of the uh, all of the room for a lot of the support equipment, and then uh, and then just that uh, uh, that that flexibility, because again, you know, you're designing a space for the next 10, 20, 40 years, 50 years, you know, you don't have any idea what you're going to need there, and, and having that extra room to move things uh, move things around, reinstall different tools. And, uh, and I should mention too that, uh, as I mentioned a little bit, the uh, treating chases as the uh, as uh, ISO five uh, class one hundred space as well. So um, one thing I, I was talking to, uh, to, to 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 one of my guys, I'm like, hey, so like, you know, if you're thinking about the cleaner, what's one of the what's one of the things you really want me to tell you remind people about? It's like, don't forget about all the little things. <laughs> So you know, the, just getting tool, just getting tools in and out. This is an example of when we put, put our second second stepper in. So this is the uh, this is the platform that goes on the raised floor. As you can see, it it fit, but boy, it, this is pretty close. And in fact, to uh, to get the tool itself in, which is when we move this in, you'll see that the uh, the, uh, the door we actually pulled the door off. So uh, we just needed that extra couple inches so that we could get the uh, so that we could get the stepper in. So uh, you know, it, it's, it's some of these uh, some of these little things. You know, don't don't uh, um, bury yourself in a corner. Um, <coughs> also, the support equipment takes up uh, takes up a lot of room. There's sort of the, uh, the, the, the the processing support equipment. You know, you need spray nurture dryers. You need you know uh, you know uh, uh, annual furnaces. You know things like that that you're going to want to have in the base space. But in the chase space, you need room for the pumps and gas pods and chillers and all the chemical cabinets, um, you know, the desks of tools, you know, how are people going to actually use the space? What's the flow going to look like? Where are they going to put their wafer down to mount it on the, uh, you know, to mount it on the, uh, the, you know, the, uh, the installation carrier? And then I, I think, uh, uh, well, actually, a, a really particularly interesting one is the uh, egress for electrical panels. So we've actually, uh, our original design was we had electrical panels, they're in a nice place. It's, very difficult to put things in front of because of just general walking egress. We've never had a problem there, but then we would run the power to uh, to the back of the tool, where then we'd have a dedicated disconnect. And so, uh, depending on the nature of that disconnect, we need to have egress in front of it. And we're, we're oftentimes uh, challenged to quite do that properly, shall we say? And so, uh, one of the things that we've been going to now is actually just putting plugs in receptacles. For tools, so now we can meet the lock and tag out requirements by actually doing doing the uh, doing the disconnect, and so that's another one. And then I think you know a big one, if you're going to have anything having to do with toxic gases, which I think you would probably almost have to have a chlorine netcher at least, and and hopefully some uh, some furnaces, is uh, you know is a is a good toxic gas plan. Where are you going to keep it? How are you going to detect it? How are you going to make sure it's safe when it goes out? So um, I mentioned that fire. So here's some fun pictures. So not surprisingly, it was a it was a plastic bench, which also tends to uh, melt. Uh, the uh, it was acetone. Who knew that acetone was flammable? And it didn't get along with electrical equipment. So uh, anyway, that was uh, that was a bit uh, uh, a bit of fun. We actually still have two. Actually, now it's one. We got rid of one of one of the tools recently. Uh, for a long time, we had two tools that survived the fire that was producing some uh, some great science. Uh, one of them, which uh, had just been just been retired, but another uh, another small asher is working working quite good. 
but uh, learning from that fire, we've gone to a, uh, you know, obviously the H5 occupancy, you know, doing fully sprinkled, fully sprinkled space, including the benches. Uh, the benches also, again, given our, given our history, we also put in uh, a CO2 fire suppression system as well. So it's a very uh, food and suspenders or belt and suspenders uh, approach for that. And then, uh, of course, the benches have a UVIR uh, uh, on them uh, as well. Uh, well, UVIR for the fire release panels and then for the toxic gas uh, cabinet and uh, toxic gas tools that have um, uh, that would get uh, that would get grumpy if they got too hot. So uh, have a lot of uh, a lot of detection as you would sort of expect for for an H side H five space. So when it came to the design, so you know back even before it was it was sort of a funded a funded thing. We were trying to think like you know what would this look like, and there were sort of these two these two options. I think option one largely uh, revolved around the idea of keeping the old five thousand square foot clean room and then add space to it. And then, uh, and then this uh, this other option too, but uh, what we ended up uh, uh, going through, which was this original plan here on the left, was uh, uh, was from 2009. <laughs> you know, things are <coughs> things are all funded. Uh, the buildings uh, they're starting to break ground on it, and uh, you know, we've got this uh, this nice shell of a clean room, but they're sort of only going to fill out half of it, and that's because we didn't have enough money. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll find the money later. And uh, you know maybe we could do a full build out. Well, uh, the economy tanked, and uh, the, uh, the 2009 uh, American Re Recovery and Reinvestment Act passed, and uh, had uh, they were looking for shovel ready projects, and uh, this was a, a great shovel ready project, and so we were able to then uh, go from this sort of you know half half size clean room to the full size clean room that uh, that, that we have now. The uh, the ARA funding also it, we are also uh, successful in, in getting uh, let's see about twelve and a half million dollars worth of uh, worth of new equipment as well so that was uh, that was quite uh, that was quite nice <coughs> so uh, in in terms of our tool sets uh, before we had that had to move to sort of just sort of a you know bit of a, a high level look we had a we had a, an older older stepper contact printers and an older pattern generator some etch and depth tools. And uh, again, that uh, about 10, 10, uh, 10 new tools, and then uh, and then twenty four wet benches uh, to move in to the new space. So here's the uh, the new the new tool uh, layout as we, as when we moved in in, in twenty twelve. So we got a new stepper, a nice pattern generator, and uh, that's the uh, and then uh, some 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 etchers, and then some depth tools, and some uh, some furnaces, which we. Also, funny enough, had problems with our furnaces and had to replace them. And thank you again very much for the uh, for those uh, for those furnaces. That was a nice uh, that was a nice trade-in deal. It worked very well. Um, so when we uh, so when we moved in, we had uh, again this major decompression going from 5,000 square feet to 18,000. We were able to change the the tool pitch. So you know how often are the tools installed from roughly six to eight feet? Up to sort of a more healthy 12 to 14 feet, and now because you know, uh, I haven't been told we're going to build me a new building yet for a new clean room, uh, I'm looking a lot more at like a like a 10 or 11 foot pitch for uh, for tools. So so eight soft and tight, and uh, 14 is, is very very roomy. I mean, granted, it depends on the tool. Some are some are some are quite uh, uh, quite monstrous. Uh, the other thing that we've got is some uh, some ISO seven uh, class ten thousand space for move in process support where we've got you know, dicing and plating and things like that and then we've got a large uh, uh, two chamber MBE as well. The um, so included uh, some areas for toxic gases and plant expansion. The counting room this was great came from a hundred square feet where two people could be in there comfortably. Three you had to know them rather well uh, and. Uh, uh, up to the 750 square foot one. In fact, I think I was just in there just a couple of weeks ago. I think I saw like 10 people in counting at the same time. I was like, this is great. Uh, and then we yeah, tried to concentrate our uh, fluorine etch tools in one area, and then uh, and obviously the lithography ballroom. So this is where all that stuff lives. So we've got our, our uh, ISO, uh, 10, 000, or ISO 7 plus 10,000 space. Here's that expansion for the UBL. We put all of our toxic gases over in this corner. 
We've actually only got a couple windows at the space, which is right along this uh, uh, this wall right here. So we put the toxic gases where one of the firefighters could come in and look and see easier, which is also uh, the opposite corner from lithography. Try and keep uh, keep that uh, keep that stuff away. You know, the big galley room, uh, a, a sort of focused area for uh, for flooring etch tools. But we also have flooring etch tools in other in other parts of the space as well. So um, from a building design perspective, the, uh, this is sort of what the building looks like. You get an idea of sort of that, that rough space. So there are about 68 uh, 20 foot by 20 foot um, uh, lab units uh, up here. Offices are along here, two floors, and then this is a conference room. And you know, sort of standard things for you know, temperature, humidity, vibration control. So this is all slab on grade with the uh, with the, uh, the various uh, um, uh, support uh, uh, air handling or air air distribution and then air generation uh, on the second and third floor, and uh, and the, the vibrations are, are, are pretty good. We sort of get the in the in the in the main in the main building sort of VCE G ish uh, uh, thing. So it's a nice uh, it's a nice quiet uh, nice quiet space. So. Um, so when we went through the design piece, really, I think the, the big lesson was make sure that, make sure that the, make sure you have somebody who's in the room where decisions are being made, that those decisions affect them. So if you're talking about where to put an elevator, you really want to know whether or not you're gonna, that elevator is going to be near something that cares about there being an elevator nearby, as in you know, sensitive uh, scientific equipment. Um, you know that engagement's just really, really important, and you know having somebody who sort of understands what that back end science looks like is, uh, is 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 really uh, is really handy. And remember, you know, you're building this for for science, so get the you know make sure the scientists are are really involved, and the stakeholders are are, are there. Um, you know, each uh, each area is going to have somebody who. You know, it's going to have aspects that are uh, that are pretty specialized. You know, the, the, you know the water, right? So you're probably going to want to go for E1 water. I don't know. You want E1 dash three, E1 dash two. I don't know. It depends. You know, with the CMST clean room, you guys update to E1 dash two, I think, or E1 dash one. Yeah. So anyway, I mean, part of their part of their uh, uh, the CMST fabs uh, uh, update on their water system was they upgraded it from just sort of the, the flat E1 to I think it was an E1 dash two. And uh, you know, if you don't even know what that means, well, then you should have somebody there who you know who, who does. Uh, and another big one is you know uh, having an idea for what budget changes look like. You know, they can go they can go down. Usually that's the case, but sometimes they go up, and that's what happened to us, which was a which was a really nice uh, you know uh, fortunate aspect. And uh, when they went up, we actually originally didn't have any benches. Purchase to, to move into the space. We were going to have to, you know, pull out our old benches from our old clean room and, and sort of cobble them together and hope that they would work. And that was really nice when we actually knew we'd have benches. Uh, the other thing that was interesting is uh, is sort of the nature of the of the government uh, purchasing system. You might say it was done in uh, sort of three parts. Uh, we had uh, HDR was the was the design architect. Who came up with the plans for the for for phase one and phase two? Phase one was with one company. They basically uh, you know, put the foundation in and built the shell of the building. And then phase two was uh, Whitey Turner was the uh, was the was the general contractor who came in and then did all the lab fit up and built the clean room and things like that. And so sort of like you know, three different three different pieces. And so uh, one one of the challenges then for the for the clean room. Again, because they had done the design, they start started breaking ground, and then we got money to finish out the clean room. Well, the the uh, the support posts in the uh, for the building were on a particular pitch. We're not really going to be moving those around at, at all. So now we had to fit, fit the clean, the clean room within that pitch and figure out what the what the layout's going to be. So if you uh, I don't know if I have any good pictures here, but. If you if you look at the uh, look at the clean room carefully, you'll notice there's some like, why is that post right there? And so anyway, that, but you know it's things that we had to uh, we had to figure out. So a couple fun you know construction pictures. You can see this is the uh, 
This is the main level <laughs> here, and these little tabs on the uh, you know on the posts. That's where the interstitial level is going to go, and then uh, and then the uh, and then the second or the penthouse level above. Yeah, they start building stuff. It's very exciting. Uh, I think I've seen some uh, various uh, various clean rooms that have done this. You guys should totally do this. Put in a, a time lapse camera in a couple places. Really fun to you know see see how that works. I know uh, University of Chicago's got got one up on their website. You can go and go and look at. It. I've seen seen other ones. So uh, we didn't do that on this, but uh, for some other stuff in the future, we probably will. Um, yeah. So you got to build a clean room and uh, make sure it gets certified properly and make sure all the seals are are good. So we've got a thousand of these HEPA filters. You know we're full uh, you know full ceiling uh, 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 HEPA. So this poor guy had to go in. And, and measure uh, measure each one of those, and in the end, got a really nice building, just great. This is a, a example of the uh, of the main corridor. The clean rooms just behind this wall here, and then the uh, the labs all have these fairly nice surface uh, surface galleries. So uh, when it comes to the construction piece, uh, you know one of the big one of the big ones is you know like you know, you know who's in charge, who's keeping an eye on 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 things. You know who's going to be the who's going to be the final occupant for that, or if you're not sure who the final occupant's going to be, make sure they've got a good proxy who can who can get an eye and keep an eye on it. And you know who are you going to call when there's a when there's a problem? You're like, wait, why is this here? Uh, and obviously, you know that scientific staff being involved in the construction phases too. Uh, and then um, you know having having good communication on the design and the construction side is also is also really uh, is is really valuable, and for us that was really hard because the, the 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 design architects had finished their design years ago, and they were sort of starting to get annoyed with all the all, with all the questions that uh, that they were being asked, and so uh, that that was a, that was a challenge that was a challenge for us. And another big <coughs> one is you know all the all the ver all the variety of systems, making sure there's good documentation of how they work. You've got good training. We've got not just one person who happened to see a few things on it, but you know really understands the understands all the systems because they're very complicated. So our uh, our uh, move and commissioning timeline was uh, uh, we, we we sort of did the uh, the ripping off the bandaid approach, I guess I'd say, from uh, from the old space. So basically, in the in the beginning of 2012, we started moving uh, moving new new tools in. And by the end of March, we uh, just pulled the Band-Aid and wrapped up all the tools and started moving them in. The, uh, the building was uh, had a grand opening, and this director and, and other, uh, other, other fancy people came out for that. The, uh, the clean room did take a little bit longer than the rest of the building, not surprisingly. And we got that in, uh, in July of 2012. It was sort of a, a mutual, uh, I guess a mutually agreed uh, handoff. It wasn't. You know, like you know, there wasn't like a hard day. They were still doing some installs, but it was sort of the, you know, it was sort of like we were past that 50% point in the uh, in the in the new tool installs. And I, I should say that all of those tools, about three quarters of them were covered for uh, for the uh, the contractor to do the installation. So they uh, the moves were uh, the installation uh, documents were put together by HDR or. Our design architect, and uh, and about three quarters of those were in, uh, those tools were included, and uh, that was uh, largely because we had the we had the funding through Ara to be able to uh, to be able to cover that. So um, getting lithography up is really sort of that first uh, that first real key thing. Getting the pattern generator and then the, and then the steppers up. And I should notice uh, note that uh, you know although we we largely pulled off the the band aid as in like everything's closed you can't do fab for a while, which is uh, painful. I know there's lots of other approaches and that'll probably talk about about uh, about their, uh, their their approach too. We did keep up the furnaces and the PCBD capability. They're just very complicated and, uh, and uh, wanted to wanted to make sure that we had that up. So. Um, Here's some of the move. This is uh, actually Peter. He works for me now. Peter Lowell. This, these are his PhD chips that uh, he did his final measurements on to to uh, to take his PhD. And this is what a fab looks like when you get it all wrapped up and ready to uh, ready to move up. And uh, it's sort of exciting watching a, watching a clean room move. And then uh, 
Yeah, start moving uh, moving tools in. Uh, I don't know, uh, Lester's here. Here are our uh, five uh, five Lester's right here. We've got one more, but it's in a different part of the clean room, so sort of a nice uh, a nice a nice view there. And uh, we had uh, in in all about seven months of downtime. So that March until you know sort of October was when we, our first what I call complicated chips. People were doing some small things before then, but this was a, a Mux 11D wafer. So this is a multiplexer that uh, is very popular with the uh, the, uh, the, uh, the CMB uh, astro astronomical uh, community. And so uh, we did uh, we did utilize the uh, the SiO2 uh, PCD system from the old the old cleaner for this, but but by and large that uh, actually I think bicep three is not no no longer no longer in service. But anyway, it was uh, did some good science for a long time. So uh, one of the things that was really interesting in the in the conditioning I should mention I don't think I have it on this uh, on this slide is is having an independent. <coughs> Uh, third-party uh, commissioning agent or a, or, or a company to be able to come in with the various expertises to make sure that you know, that everything everything uh, is uh, is looking looking good. So again, that third party being being key, they're not in the pocket of the of the uh, uh, of the design build uh, firm, and they're not the, in the pocket of Yale, but uh, but really looking out to make sure that everything's uh, everything's there. So, for instance, you know, does the you know does the air handling uh, you know the air handling unit work? You know, oh yeah, sure, it, it's blowing air. Well, but does it is it at the right pressure? Sounds like there was a problem with pressure <laughs> in uh, at, at, at times. And I mean, for us, the uh, the pressure, temperature, humidity control optimization really took years. A lot of that has to do with uh, Colorado being an interesting uh, climactic environment in the summers where it'll be. You know, nice and warm and dry, and then we'll have a thunderstorm go over, and it just turns everything upside down. Um, you know, and we did find some interesting things. You know, we had some stuff. There was a damper that was wired backwards, which is maybe one reason why we had some trouble, or I should say, that facilities people had trouble uh, getting the uh, getting that working. The uh, the information flow is uh, is an, is an important one. I just tried to uh, uh, just hoover up as many. Uh, as many documents as I possibly could, and it's really turned out to be helpful. In you know, just a few years ago, we had uh, our waste neutralization system went down, and nobody had any drawings for it. And I went and dug up and, and found them. So make sure you've got a good uh, a good uh, sharing uh, sharing relationship there. You know, contingency is always good. Things always cost more than you think, and um, you know. Uh, Making sure you're obviously following code, and uh, make sure you get a good a good handle on that. So, just a, a quick thing on the the tax, toxic gas monitoring system. This was a, a bit of a uh, I don't know if lack of communication or whatever, but but the system was originally designed with two communication loops. So there was this one here, and then this larger one up here. And it was really, really not balanced. Uh, basically, this <coughs> idea of a toxic gas corner is where everything was. And so our system gets very grumpy, or got very grumpy when it got to 64 units. Just too many, uh, too many communication crashes. Uh, this is an area that was thought as a, you know, a possible expansion for, uh, for toxic gases, <coughs> largely because we put an Oxford um, uh, Oxford etcher there that we were going to have methane and hydrogen in, which we ended up in not uh, not using at all. So well, anyway, if we had to rework that. It was not the end of the world. I got to learn a lot more about how the uh, TGMS system uh, works for for our space. The um, you know this uh, the toxic gas infrastructure is just a, a big important one. Obviously, you got to you got to do this. You got to do this right. And all the storage and the detection, monitoring, abatement. Yeah, so we've got a we we like these uh, these SDC uh, cabinets. We've got some old um, uh, old uh, bird box uh, uh, water flow uh, water spray scrubbers, which are actually we're in the process of uh, trying to update those, upgrade them to something uh, a little more a little more modern. But these Dallatech scrubbers they were worked, uh, worked pretty nice. Um, so for our uh, for our benches, if you remember the uh, safety. Safety piece, so uh, you know, having the, the fire control system and the CO2 on the back is uh, is, is is quite uh, is quite handy. Um, and again, you know, 
fire. If you burn to clean your down, we'll try not to do that again. It's, uh, yeah. So anyway, that's, uh, yeah. Well, we haven't had any problems since then. Um, so uh, yeah, the, uh, you know, our, our, uh, our benches have, uh, you know, a lot of different utilities on them. I, I mean, one thing to just think about is, you know, how are you going to stuff everything back there at trying to minimize, uh, minimize footprints? Because as, as we've been in our space for 11 years now, thinking about the, uh, where, where we're going to put things and how we're going to move things around is uh, quite, uh, quite an interesting challenge. So one thing that we, uh, that I, think, I think the designers did really nice, uh, nicely on and, uh, and that we really like is in the uh, chases uh, overhead, at roughly sort of like the seven and a half, uh, seven and a half foot level is the, uh, is the uh, uh, utility tray. So we run, uh, you know, we run you know, lots of different, um, you know, uh, lots of a variety of different utilities, and then uh, our overly welded uh, gas lines for, uh, for delivery as well. And then uh, in general, behind every tool, we've also got a nice, uh, a nice utility rack so that everything's well, uh, well marked, we know where it all is, it's got shutoffs, it's got all the right, the right, uh, the right detection. And um, you know, thinking about what the space, what the space uh, and footprint looks like for that as well. And as we've been there more, we're we're having to rework some of these because we were uh, took advantage of the space that we had at the time that now we don't have as much. And uh, you work really hard, you end up with a nice clean room. I'm sure, you guys will have a great clean room when it's all over. Um, we usually do have more than just three people or two people in the in the fab at a time. Oh, there are three there. Yeah, right there. Um, so uh, I think a big uh, again this you know thinking thinking ahead that you know what's the ten year twenty year time horizon? It seemed like we had a lot of space and it would last for for decades, and it's really sort of starting to get fairly full. We've managed to increase our lithography from four to six tools. Uh, our deposition capabilities. We've added ten deposition tools and then a number of uh, dry edge tools. And uh, uh, with, uh, with, with chips coming, we're, we're hoping to be able to uh, to continue that. There are there are a fair number of holes, as I'm calling them, in the uh, in the system. That uh, I'm I, I always seem to uh, over uh, overestimate these things. That we've got more time than we than we have. I really doubt we actually have 10 years worth of uh, capability uh, or in terms of space. It'll probably will probably fill it up in five years. And then you got to figure out what you're going to take out. And we've already taken some tools out, so that's not uh, it's not uh, completely completely true. But uh, then that becomes an interesting question. Right? There's some legacy tool that's critical for somebody's for some group's process, and you got to figure out how to uh, how to uh, how to pull that out. So um, the user model I wanted to go over is something else that had to morph. So again, we you know, started back in the 70s, and uh, and uh, as uh, you know, just a couple uh, you know a couple researchers really creating some clean space. It was uh, started getting utilized a bit more in the 80s. The NSA really liked the fact that we could make uh, these uh, uh, these squids and for you know high speed adders and things like that. So that was a that was a big piece that sort of helped that out, and then in the 90s we had a lot more uh, uh, a lot more interest from the rest of the site. So the magnetism community, for instance, came in and started uh, started utilizing the um, uh, utilizing that space. Uh, Dave Wineland came in and in in, in, uh, in 2000 he ended up winning the Nobel Prize in uh, in, in physics in 2012, and he uh, you know, started doing his ion traps and things like that. So. It really started started growing, but really it was a it was this uh, somewhat compact space. It was largely superconductivity. It was a group of people that that you know, went out to you know play volleyball together and drink beers on Fridays, and you know it was this it was a it was this nice small community. So now we move into this eighteen thousand square foot clean room that now like just like these are really, really far apart, and you don't have to. You don't have to get along quite as much because you don't have to be next, right next to people, and um, uh, we. So when we, when we, so when we first moved in, you know, we, we tried to keep our, our our original model, and this is largely it. You know, it's very community based. It's uh, you know researcher directed. It was fast. It was agile. Researchers would be in there fixing tools, 
they didn't, I mean, I didn't get hired until the end of 2011 to, uh, you know, to help oversee this, uh, you know, the, you know, moving into the new space. So, I mean, really not a lot of, not a lot of staff. And the researchers were the ones, you know, changing the pump oil and, and uh, you know, making sure that the, the water system was working. And so what I tried to do coming in was I wanted to create a moat around the, around the, uh, the, uh, the actual space inside, if you will. So that you know all of those externalities that clean rooms need, you know, air and water, you know the safety, the cleanliness. Like the researchers didn't have to think about that. They could focus on you know I need this EVM tool to do this thing. I need to make sure I get the right stress on niobium so I can make sure it superconducts and it matches the rest of my the rest of my processing so so uh, films don't fly off. And so um, so that was largely how we how we worked. We also. Being a uh, captured facility, we have the uh, uh, we're able to um, set a uh, we have a what we call a head count. So how much do people use the space? We don't keep track of and we still don't how uh, how often people go in. So we don't have like a, you know a badge reader. We have a badge reader for, for safety and access so people can get in. But we don't have uh, but we don't keep track of everybody. We don't charge them by the hour. We don't keep track of which tools they're using. They could use the EBL or a contact printer. They could put down a micron of gold or, you know, a micron of aluminum. You know, we never, we don't, we don't, we didn't bother. Uh, we didn't bother with that. We sort of just came up with this headcount and a uh, sort of a community generated, uh, um, you know, how much you, how much you use the space. So we'll, you know, sort of say, you know, oh, you know, I, you're in here about as much as me. And anyway, we had this like this very nice, uh, this nice space, this nice way of. Of doing it, and um, uh, the uh, and again with this uh, uh, rather rather small staff, the the 6.3 is sort of that equivalent uh, uh, now. Uh, and um, but one of the really key things that we ran into that was an interesting challenge was this you know the user community helping fix these uh, the tools and doing the new processes. So the users still take care of all their processes. What we found there is a challenge, again, with the size and the scale of uh, the more general use equipment. So lithography, you know, a general use evaporator, a general use flooring etcher, and things like that. And so what we ended up doing was really trying to keep as much as we, as we could before, but really sort of start de developing some boundaries to help uh, delineate who's going to be responsible for what. So we came up with this core, uh, core tool, non-core tool uh, piece. And so, uh, you know, uh, you know, my staff's here to, you know, to help everybody out if they need some help. But they're sort of on the non-core tools. They're the uh, they're 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 the first responders. And so, you know, those core tools are the you know, a lot of the, the the infrastructure of the space. You know, the, the benches, uh, lithography, metrology, and then a, a few sort of general purpose tools. They're just really highly utilized. And then the non-core tools are. You know, a lot of those, uh, you know, a lot of those, um, you know, especially deposition tools or uh, some of those edge tools, things like that. And um, you know, I, I feel like these these lists are always up for uh, negotiation to sort of see, you know, what uh, what makes sense. But you know, we're always bounded by our um, our uh, resource limitations with funding. I mean, we can't just you know, don't have enough enough funds to go hire a bunch of people. And even if we had the funds, it's an interesting question, is that what's going to get the best science? So the lady who makes, so Anna Fox, just a lady, she's a, she's a, she's a great researcher, she makes the voltage standard. So she makes sure that her system, which we call it the SNS, does a superconducting uh, uh, niobium, uh, superconducting normal metal superconductor uh, trilayer for the Josephson junction uh, for, the, for that process. She's the one that's in there. She's you know, changing the changing the target. She's you know, scrubbing it down. She takes care of that tool, so it does exactly what she needs to be able to make that voltage standard. And I would, I'd like to think that me and my staff would care as much as her. There's no way. Like that. That's that's her whole career. And so, and that's not just you know one example. I mean, we make the uh, these carbon nanotube for us. For uh, you know, for uh, 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 lots of different uh, radiometry projects, they they keep their tool up and they keep it going, and so I think that you know figuring out what that user model is, which for you guys here is going to be an interesting one because it's it, you 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 have a 
uh, a different, uh, you know, a very different mission and a different group of, uh, you know, a different group of people that you're that you're trying to support. Grad students are only here for so long. Postdocs are only here for so long. But there's probably some mission continuity uh, aspects that you want to keep up. So figuring out what that balance looks like. So uh, just you know, real quick on what our roles and responsibilities are. You know, I we really. You know, I feel like I'm responsible for the infrastructure, you know, buying a bunch of stuff, and then all the safety, and then the users are really responsible for the, uh, the tool and process risk there. Uh, uh, the training is another interesting piece, since we have, this, <coughs> we have the super user model, where, we're, um, uh, where, the, uh, where the, the, the users are doing, our, the, the tool stewards, they're keeping an eye on it. We also really like to have other members, uh, other, uh, lots of different groups use a tool, and the training then would come from other members of that same group. But then the super users sort of double checking to make sure the training, uh, the training makes sense and, and that they've, they've picked things up uh, uh, well. So, you know, really in, in, in conclusion, I think the, you know, the communication information flow, super important, the stakeholder involvement, making sure you have got the right experts that are here to work with, uh, you know, work with the you know, both the construction side and the architects. Safety is obviously just a you know a huge fundamental piece. And I, I guess I should just add one thing on on safety. I when I went to grad school, I never knew I'd have to read NFPA documents, but um, yeah, they're really important. And I think getting uh, making sure that your that your you know the, the the clean room staff that's related to you know whatever aspect it happens to be, you know, toxic gases or or whatever, that they understand a bit of what's going on with the code, and they might not be experts in it, so like, you know, help you know, get them up to speed so they understand why decisions are made, because if you just say, oh, well, you can't do that. Oh, well, why? I mean, they're, they, yeah, it's uh, super, super important, I think, for that uh, funding, being ready to, 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 uh, to adapt, and then, um, you know, really think, of, you know, how you're gonna be using the space in the end. You know, making sure you've got the egress in the right place. You've got a decent work triangle and lithography. Uh, you know, all of that. I mean, just even how you're going to gown, how you're going to get equipment in, how you're going to wipe things down. So, uh, one you know, final thing. Jim Bell was a uh, uh, researcher at NIST. He's recently retired, but we can't seem to get rid of him. He loves it there, so he still comes in and uh, and, and largely takes care of the furnaces and, the, and, and some of the trees and stuff. But he's uh, yeah he's he's been around for been around for a long time yeah th this is this is great I uh, this is actually our, our hydrofluoric acid bench and so uh, I was like I don't know if I'll ever get that picture again of somebody in the HF bench uh, oh and then this of course is the uh, not of course you guys don't know but this is that uh, that Asher one of the only tools that survived the fire and Jim was here uh, uh, started here actually in 1980 as a grad student. And then, uh, so he was here for the fire and largely responsible for not only the, uh, the, the rebuilding in uh, 88, but also the expansion in 2000, and then uh, this space as well. So he's just, you know, just a brilliant guy. It's really, really great to, to have that, that experience. So, yeah, any questions? Uh, John, I have a question about the raised floor, which we can see in this photograph. Seeing as a majority of your tools are backed right up to the service chases, could you explain like, which tools or which utilities you found the raised floor beneficial for in terms of utility distribution specifically? Yeah, um, well, let's see. I mean, if we just look right here, you see there's, a, there's some water lines going right through the floor there, and that's sort of handy. Um, is there, what else is there? This one, uh, these, the, the way these luskers are, are, are put together, they've got this um, big umbilical that goes between the electronic track and the tool. And so uh, being, able to, you know, being able to route that, in this case, Jim, you're just you know, uh, laying right on the floor. The, um, uh, let's see, the exhaust lines on this. Oh yeah, the, the exhaust line's fairly, uh, fairly small you know, with, the, uh, with, with the with the cryo pump on here and then the turbo on the load block. So the um, I guess to maybe answer your question, we've 
what we try to do is put the uh, the noisy things that don't need to be in clean space in the in the chase, and then the uh, you know the nicer tools and especially their load blocks in the uh, in the bay. And you probably notice that there's a hole right here. Well, there's a load block arm that sticks into the chase. Um, I don't know, maybe another two feet or something like that. So you know, being able to use that wall is. Um, I mean, clearly it's a, it's a hard wall, so that things stay clean, but I sort of think of it as like this permeable membrane. When we're installing a tool, you know, one of the, one of the questions I always ask a vendor when we're, when we're talking about it, and like, well, where, where, where can I cut a hole in the wall so it can be uh, installed, you know, either a flush mount or maybe it's in the bay. So like this tool, for instance, right here is, uh, is, a, is flush mount, but it's completely in the bay. And so, um, I think the nice thing, the thing that I really like about the raised floor is it provides this uh, whole additional um, uh, dimension, if you will, for, uh, for being able to do the installations and running things. So uh, since our clean room keeps getting fuller and fuller, which is a really good high quality problem to have, we're running more and more stuff in the, in the, in the subfloor. So power, for instance, we're starting to run oh, extra slides. We're starting to run a lot, uh, uh, you know, a, a lot of the power in the in, in the subfloor, and I would remind people too: you still got to clean clean rooms, including the subfloor too. It's a uh, it's a piece. Now, I'd I'd love to have a, a full subfab. The Kidersburg clean room's got a real subfab, uh, and and that's that's really uh, that's very handy. But for us, that uh, the raised floor is really really handy. Um, very, I think I think maybe one of the things that to really think about for you know for that twenty that twenty year out thing is 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 the flexibility of the space. At some point, you're just going to have you're just going to have lines running everywhere, uh, you know, different gases and different different things like that. And just having that flexibility and having that additional space to be able to solve those problems. Yeah. I have to disagree about the uh, subfloors. Um, Microphone, floor. please. Raised floors make everything. <laughs> All right. I just want to comment that uh, raised floors have a lot of disadvantages. Uh, they're really not optimal for installing heavy equipment. It makes big equipment very, very expensive and complex to install and make moving equipment very difficult to move. And we're constantly moving equipment. And also, uh, in a lot of states, they require electronics to be in plenum rated conduit and have separate fire suppression systems so it makes everything more expensive too. So given the trade-offs I would much rather have a solid floor. Yeah so um, it, the, uh, the vibration is, is, a, uh, uh, is an important one. So we have a number of um, I call them TMC plates but they're these you know uh, raised platforms and, uh, and, and, we, and we have tools on them. So we have both steppers the EBL, the SEM, uh, are all on those raised platforms. Actually, our flip chip longer as well. And then uh, we also have a uh, we have a deep reactive ion metro that's got a really big uh, turbo pump on it. If turbo stops suddenly, it can flip over. Apparently, that's happened once, uh, not in our facility, somewhere in Japan. And uh, and so then that's bolt, that can be bolted down uh, as well. So that uh, the the stability piece is is something that is is easy to. Is, is, is easy to solve the, um, yeah. yeah Put, so it's putting an E-beam on a raised floor on a platform is not right. Um, no, having, this far. you can do a lot better just by putting it on bedrock on the solid floor and it costs less too. Yeah, well so I mean our, our, our EBL sits on a, uh, on a design platform that is for, uh,